So we study through books of the Bible here at the Village Chapel, and uh, during the Advent season, we're taking passages uh, that have to do with the uh, person of Christ and how each of the four Gospels present them. If you need a copy, we've got extra ones. Just raise your hand. We've got some folks here distribu distributing those, and they'd be glad to drop one off at your chair uh, or your row or your aisle. This morning, we're looking at John's Gospel and uh, the way he presents Christ as the Word made flesh. We'll talk about what that means in just a little bit. Um, we've pointed out already, I think, that the four Gospels, each of those writers, uh, it, it's, it's almost impossible, I think, to separate who they were as, gospel, as the writers of the four Gospels from how they present Christ. Matthew, who was formerly Levi, a Jewish uh, man, but who was a tax collector, a record keeper, if you will, presents Jesus as the fulfillment of Scripture. And so he, well versed in, in the Jewish Scriptures, could be the one to connect the dots between Jesus and the Old Testament. And so as he writes, he writes with a Jewish audience in mind. Mark seems to present Jesus as the servant king, dwells quite a bit on uh, Christ's sacrifice, how he came to lay down his life for us. But yet he is also the king of a new kingdom. It's a completely new way of being, a, keep, a completely new realm for us to, to be uh, invited into. Uh, and so the gospel does this, and Mark presents Jesus as both servant and king. We need that. We need our kings to be servants, and we need, our, we, we, we need to be saved. We need a servant who is a king as well, somebody that has the power of a king, but at the heart of of a servant, and that is uniquely found in the ultimate servant king, Jesus. Luke presents Jesus as the savior of the world. Luke, the Gentile writer, the only one we know of that was a Gentile that wrote a New Testament book. And he writes what amounts to about 25% of the New Testament in the book of Luke and the book of Acts, if you put those together. It's quite a volume of literature that God would choose someone from outside of the Jewish uh, background to write uh, 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 that much of the New Testament. But it's wonderful, and he's the right one that God chose and, uh, and inspired to present Jesus as the Savior of the world, that this offer is broad. It's universal, actually. It's, a, it's for all who will repent and believe, is that you? Um, that's the offer. The offer of the gospel is beautiful. It's wonderful. Um, the gospel is not just good advice. It's great news about what God has done in Christ. So he's the savior of the world, Luke says. And John, today we'll see that, presents him as the word made flesh. Lots of images. John, the really poetic one, I think, of, of the four Gospels, and uh, one that um, a very close friend of Jesus. Uh, we have in Matthew and in John, we have eyewitnesses, people that were very close to Jesus, walked with him, sat around campfires with him, saw him heal, saw him preach, heard him preach, uh, passages that most of us are very familiar with. But here, John will be talking, and he's going to reach all the way back to the beginning of time. He doesn't do a birth narrative, neither does Mark. We find the birth narrative in Matthew and in Luke, uh, but here we have uh, John connecting Jesus all the way back to the beginning before creation itself happened because he says, in the beginning was, that is already existing, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and so it's really powerful here. Um, words uh, really at the front end of, of John's gospel. And I'd say, too, at the front end of the book of Genesis, we hear John echoing those few words that begin the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created. So it's like John is saying, God did that in the beginning and created everything, and now there is a new beginning. And it's all wrapped up in the person, Jesus Christ, who's the Word. And he was actually with God in the original beginning. Not only was he with him, and that word is rich in meaning, it, it almost means there's an inseparable intimacy between God the Father, Creator, and Jesus the Son of God, and that they're face to face in such a beautiful, powerful, relational way. And of course, we now know, having the benefit of the entire, you know, 66 books library of the, that we call the Bible, that our God is Trinitarian, three in person, uh, one in essence, Father, Son, Spirit. That's the way he reveals himself. In Genesis, both God the Father who speaks, let there be, and there was. And the Spirit, we're told, was hovering over the water. So God the Spirit mentioned there as well. And now John tells us that even the Son was there. 
the Word of God was there with God, and the Word was God. So words, very, very important. When I was a kid, my mom used to say two things about the music I listened to. Maybe this happened to you too. My mom used to say my music was too loud and that she could not understand the words. Did anybody else have that experience with... Okay. And now uh, th that you're older, is the music of the younger ones too loud and you can't understand the words? Yeah. And I, I had the objection that, you know, Mom, I don't listen to the words anyway. They're not really important, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, she, yeah, but it's saying this. And, you know, and it, it, you know though, that meant something way different back in her time than it did in my time. <laughs> and that's the way it is now, too. I mean, we got songs, you know, when I was growing up, when I was starting about 20s and 30s, we got songs that say that, that something was bad, and that meant it was good. And so words have been sort of kicked around, and they, they, it's very fluid, you know, the meaning of our words. Mom was right in a lot of ways um, about the importance of the words. Um, I think I've kind of persuaded her that I was right about the volume of the music. <laughs> And especially now that we have headphones, and I can sort of keep that to myself and not bother her. But um, uh, being uh, uh, close to words and thinking about the words that are sung, that we sing, that are in songs we listen to, that are a part of the diet of input we get, whether it's musical or non-musical input. But being careful and, and watching what's on the menu that you take in. Uh, in terms of words. I think that's really important. Before time began, the book of Genesis tells us, before the heavens were formed, there was the echo in that last half of that first nanosecond when God said, let there be light. And words had already been deployed. So God takes words seriously. And the word was there in the beginning. And I think it makes sense that we should take words seriously as well. There's a contemporary writer who has said, you can gauge the size of a ship that is passed out of sight by the size of the wake that it leaves behind. What about Jesus? Why such a huge wake in history? How is it that this poor first century carpenter, stonemason turned rabbi how is it that the entire Western calendar pivots on his life? How's that possible? Why 2,000 plus years later are we sitting around still talking about him? Why is he the subject of so many movies, so many books, so many blog posts, so many tweets, so many Christmas and holiday concerts every single year? The world we live in, in its attempt to secularize or edge God out, E-G-O, oh, ego, um, to edge God out. The world struggles. I've just been in, in New York City, and it's just decked out, you know, with lights and twinkle this and twinkle that and all this sort of thing. But there's an obvious lack. I mean, there, 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 there are some people that are working really hard to edge out sort of the songs that, that will we'll talk about Christ or whatever. So there's a lot of little, you know, grandma got run over by a reindeer, which, you know, that's fine. It's like you laugh a little, that's fine. But, but there, you, you, every now and then one squeaks through, and you'll be in a very, very general market setting, and you'll hear Nat King Cole, you know, sing some Oh Holy Night song. And you go, oh, that draws me in, man. That's about something bigger than grandma getting hit by a reindeer, you know. It's so much bigger, so much more meaningful because we're longing for something. And we've got a chronic problem, all of us do. We're chronically longing to figure out where it is we're supposed to take our worship. What direction do we take our gratitude? It, it, it doesn't help us enough to just go, that's pretty, because after a while, that isn't pretty anymore. You walk right past it. I grew up in Washington, D.C. I lived there and didn't even see most of what people drove a long way and flew to go and see. I didn't even see it anymore. Just took it for granted. Where is the transcendence? Where is the one who from the beginning is the one that created all things? So when we say the word made flesh is an important aspect of who Christ was, we're not just saying the guy that preached we're saying the word of God, how God thinks about 
things, how God sees things, as expressed and revealed through this person, Jesus Christ. In the wake of Jesus Christ, more has been written about him than any other figure in human history. More than Julius Caesar, more than Elvis Presley, more than John Lennon or John Kennedy, more than Bilbo Baggins, more than Frodo, and more than Harry Potter combined. More has been written about Jesus. You can judge the size of a ship that has passed out of sight by the magnitude of the wake that is left behind. Not only the person of Jesus has been talked about more than all of those personalities, but the teachings of Jesus have been written about more than the teachings of Socrates, Aristotle, Albert Einstein, C.S. Lewis, Elkhart Tolle, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, and yes, even Tim Keller. Yeah. The simple truth is Jesus is the most talked about, written about, scrutinized person that ever lived. And the Jesus of the New Testament, the Word made flesh, might not fit very well into our culture. Um, He never had millions of followers on Twitter or Instagram, never hosted a reality TV show, never starred in a movie, never wrote a book, never wore skinny jeans while pastoring a megachurch. Jesus wasn't obsessed with being relevant, and he didn't appear too concerned about the altar that most of the people in our day and time are worshiping at right now, the altar of team sport politics. He didn't seem concerned about that. Yet he lived in a time when the most oppressive regime, the Roman Empire, dominated that little insignificant strip of land called Israel, the pass-through part where empires had come and gone and run over top of it time and time again. And yet God said, these are my people. I choose them. I call them out of their suffering and out of their darkness. They are mine, just as he's doing today calling a people to himself. Maybe today is the day for you where you hear his call and you respond to his call. The word made flesh. Continue looking at chapter 1. Just I'll, I'll go down to verse 14 here. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being. That has come into being. Verse 3 is a mind blower. Nothing exists that Jesus wasn't involved in the creation of. That's, That's a pretty tall claim. If you take this seriously, if anyone reads this gospel and starts to say, what does it mean that he's the word made flesh? Well, it's more than just the blah, blah, blah made flesh. It's the one that said, let there be made flesh. And the one that said, let there be and created everything that does exist in the physical universe is the same one that allowed himself to become, I don't know how many pounds, eight pounds, nine ounces, and lie in a little manger. All of that in that tiny little baby who would then grow up to be a man three decades later and lay down his life on a cross for me. And the word would be redemption is on offer through faith in the one who took my place on the cross. The word made flesh. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And that's the way it is today as well. There are people that don't comprehend it, just don't get it. They think we're all a bunch of loons over here. Why, do you, why aren't you playing golf on Saturday morning? Aren't you, why do you go to church anymore? Does it really matter? Isn't, isn't religion irrelevant? Isn't it for the tiny-minded? Isn't it for the bigots? Isn't it for the people that are just narrow-minded and holding on to some vestige of some ancient tradition? Um, why do you need that crutch? Why do you cling to that? And people make fun of that all the time, and yet inside of all of us, we long to know how can we respond to this thing that God has planted and seemingly planted inside of us, this longing to know the one who made us, to, to be in right relationship with him. Because these lights aren't enough. These candles aren't enough for me. These songs aren't even enough. I need more. I need something eternal. 
There came a man sent from God. His name was John. This is John the Apostle writing about John the Baptist. He came for a witness. That means he came to say some things, to declare some things, that he might bear witness of the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came that he might bear witness of the light. And John the Apostle is very careful to distinguish between John the Baptist and Jesus. There was a true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. Verse 10, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Verse 10 is rich again, and it's a mind blower again. The world that was created through him, he stepped into it. That's like the painter stepping into the canvas and becoming a part of his painting. It's like the playwright writing a part for himself or herself in the play and actually becoming one of the actors in the story and yet still being the one who wrote the whole thing. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. You're still alive. I'm still alive. We still have an opportunity to receive him. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So receiving and believing go hand in hand together, as John says here. And it's, all not, it's not just about faith in faith. It's not just about believing. Just believe, our world would say. No, no, no. This is about receiving him, believing in him. It's very specific here. It's not just faith in faith. This is very popular today. But this is faith in Christ and in Christ alone. And they become children of God, verse 12 tells us, which is beautiful because while everything that exists was created by him, John 1 tells us, in other words, everything that exists belongs to him by right of he is the creator of it all. And, and so everybody belongs to him. That's true. They do in a very generic possession sense, everything belongs to him. But you're offered much more, and, and we're to preach the good news that this is on offer. You can be more than just his property. You can be his children. So important for us to see that. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Born of God. And then the last, last verse I want to read this morning, verse 14, so beautiful. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Oh, man, we need a little bit more of both of those in our day and time. Grace and truth. I mean, you may or may not have noticed, but civility kind of got tossed out the window a few years ago. We need grace. You may or may not have noticed it, but truth got tossed out the window a couple decades ago. And we're reaping the results of that. There's so much confusion, lacking consensus on what is important, what is of value, what is right, what is wrong. We lack that consensus. Why? Because there's no such thing as truth. And we are reaping what we have sown. If you deny the existence of truth, you can never, never, ever come to a place of having justice or right or wrong, right? because there's no measure for it. There's no standard for it if there's no such thing as truth. And Jesus is full of both to overflowing. I love that about about verse 14. Okay, we got to read a few more verses. All right, I, I just got to throw a few more in. All right, I know I said I was going to stop, but I, please forgive me. Verse 15, look at it. John bore witness of him and cried out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness, we've all received grace upon grace. I love that. I need that. Grace upon grace. You need that too especially you that came in here with a, uh, some kind of a cloud of guilt or shame over you for your repeated failures or your repeated mistakes or your repeated f just falling to some temptation over and over again. Guess what? There's grace upon grace upon grace, and you can't outrun his grace. Beautiful. 
Verse 17, the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, he is the, in the bosom of the Father. He has explained him. That's really, really beautiful. I don't know if this made it to the slides or not here at this campus, but I want to throw a Socrates quote up on the screen. Is that, do you guys have that? Yeah. All the wisdom of this world is but a tiny raft upon which we must set sail when we leave this earth. If only there was a firmer foundation upon which to sail. Perhaps some divine word. Oh, I wish Socrates had lived a little bit later. <laughs> he might have heard about the word made flesh. But his longing is the same longing you have and the same longing I have too. For some word to be revealed to us, not one that we have to discover, not one that we have to struggle for, but one that is where God takes the initiative, divine word, that breaks through our darkness and the, and the, and the emptiness of silence for any real answers and any grace and any truth. And here he comes. <laughs> here comes Jesus full of grace and truth, which I need more and more of, and so do you. As one of the original 12 disciples of Jesus, John had a brother named James. Some of you will know this. Um, he was another one of the 12 as well. Together they were called uh, Boanerges. It means the sons of thunder. And sometimes I like to think of these guys as the bouncers of the disciples. You know, they're kind of the sons of thunder. They're ready to rumble almost any time if they need to. They're the ones that when, they, when Jesus was going through Samaria and, and there were a bunch of people that did not receive Jesus, James and John said, you want us to call down fire from heaven on them? They're kind of the bouncers, you know, in a way. And Jesus said, no, no, I don't want to. But John, in spite of the fact that he was maybe, you know, one of the professional wrestlers called Bo and Ajaris, uh, he still seems to have this poetic tender heart. And, and he presents Christ as this word made flesh, but he wants us to rest assured that there's a God who knows our struggles, has experienced injustice, has experienced socio-political um, corruption, even in the, ch in the church of his time, the religious leaders. And all the deep darkness that covers and blinds this world, Jesus came into all of that. Um, and so when we, in our own day and time, when we have personal struggles or world struggles or nation struggles or culture struggles or whatever it might be, we're just trying to figure out what's right and wrong anymore, we are encouraged by the fact that Jesus has come as the Word made flesh. I love it that John presents him this way. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw his glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So from John chapter 1 and the rest of the Gospels as we've walked through Advent, I want to remind you between Matthew's Gospel saying he's the fulfillment of Scripture, between Mark's Gospel saying he's the ultimate servant king, between Luke's Gospel saying he's the Savior of the world, between John's Gospel saying he's the Word made flesh, we are presenting and reminding ourselves of who Jesus is. He's the center of history. Even on just a physical level, just with calendars and stuff like that, the entire Western calendar pivots on this man's life. But even if that weren't so, I'd still say he's the center of history because there is a history to the redemption narrative we read in the Bible. And it all pivots when Jesus comes into the world as the Word made flesh. So he's the focus of Scripture. He's the hope of the gospel. See, without Christ... You know, Christianity kind of gets reduced to Sheanity, or Eanity, I guess I should say, yeah. And pretty much that's nothing. Just another, it might be just another option on the religious side of things. And religion for me, I don't know about you, but religion for me ends up being just behavior modification. But because of Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, the gospel is good news, and that's heart transformation, not just behavior modification. That's heart transformation. That's where God does a work in us that we can't do for ourselves. We simply yield and receive and believe. Have you done that? Good question for all of us 
to ask ourselves. He's the Savior of the world. Is he your Savior? When Jesus came into the world, it truly is a pivot point in all of history. Wonder has been restored. Worship has been revived. Witness has been renewed. Because Jesus was made, the Word made flesh. In other words, we're not guessing anymore. What does God think? What does God want to say to us? We actually have someone we can look to who is the, as Hebrews will tell us, we'll study that next month, the exact representation of God's character, the way God thinks about everything. Here is God revealing himself most perfectly in the person Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. It's not Jesus the feels made flesh. It's not Jesus the wishes made flesh. It's Jesus, the Word, made flesh. Some people are uncomfortable with that. They would rather it be the feels made flesh or the spine-tingling spiritual numinous experience made flesh. Uh, but that's not what's on offer here. It's the Word made flesh, the Savior of the world, the servant king. As Eugene Peterson has said, the Christian gospel is rooted in language. God spoke a creation into being. Our Savior was the Word made flesh. Words, words, words everywhere. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. I love the way they sound. I love, I love the carols at Christmas. I love to hear joy to the world. It's hard to not see Chevy Chase. But even that makes me laugh a little, just like it makes you laugh a little bit. And then I ask myself the question, where is this joy coming from? Because if I look in the world, I'm not going to find it. But if I look beyond that, if I listen to the word made flesh, if I look to the one who, in whom everything was created and everything holds together by the power of his word, then all of a sudden there is joy on offer. It's inexhaustible. It keeps going going in spite of the suffering because the interesting thing about the four gospels and especially the two birth narratives is how con how, how much of a contrast they are you know on the on the, on the one hand we have you know in the Matthean account we have these wise men that come from the east and they come to Jerusalem and they've heard about something in, in some ancient papers they found in, in some museum somewhere that that evidently some of the Jews when they were in trapped in Babylon, had their, some of their scrolls with them. And these guys somehow are not to read about that stuff, and they see a star, and they go, we got to go check that out, and they're hungry, and you find faith where you wouldn't expect to find it, in people that weren't from Israel, that were educated, really educated people, so evidently this faith thing isn't for fools and for simple minds. Evidently, it was for the educated, too. And so they come, and they're looking because they want to worship. Herod is right there, right in proximity to Jesus, but he doesn't want to worship. He does ask the question, where is the baby? He tells the wise men to go find the baby and come back and tell them where the baby is so he can go kill him. Those of us who have read the rest of the story. He's asking where, but he has got a bad motive in mind. He's not interested in worshiping. He's interested in silencing the word made flesh because it's for him a threat that it's a word and that it's clear and that it's a new king and he's a servant and he would be humble like that. But this beautiful diversity of people that Jesus is, you know, that, that heavens open up and reveal Jesus' it, uh, arrival to include these, these foreigners from, the, but they're educated and they're from, they've come a long distance and, and, they, and they seem to have a lot of money because they've been gold, Francis, Francis, uh, frankincense, and myrrh. And then you can go over here and, and you find in Luke's, go Luke's gospel the story of the angels bursting through the night sky singing to the who? Shepherds, yeah. It's not a trick question. You guys had it right. Yeah. The shepherds. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the shepherds. Blue collar workers. Despised sociologically. You know? Uneducated. They smelled bad. Working around animals all the time, yeah? And yet, God reveals himself to them as well as to these guys over here. They're smart and rich and have all that. And both of them come and they're just... Behold, the, the, the one, with wonder, all of this happens. 
And, 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 and the story begins to unfold. And so we read our four gospels and, and they reveal to us Christ in all of these different ways. And in the person and, and work of Jesus, wonder has been restored. Worship has been revived. Witness has been renewed. You may have grown in some way cold in your faith. You may, like me occasionally, and my faith undulates, just like yours does probably. Um, you may have lost a sense of wonder. You may have in some way found your worship to be flat. And you may have even stopped thinking of yourself as a witness, like, like, the, like these shepherds were. They went back glorifying God like these magi were. When they go, they go back all the way home, they, they go home as well, and their eyes are bugging out, and they're, they're talking about how wonderful it was. Um, what about us? Where's the wonder? Where is the worship? Where you direct your worship is going to affect what you are filled with wonder about. Where you direct your worship will also impact the level of your witness. Because if this isn't the best news you've ever heard, I don't know what would be. Um, but we need to remind ourselves over and over again because we live too close to it sometimes. And we start to take it for granted sometimes. Um, G. Campbell Morgan said, chaos everywhere, break up everywhere, and yet we hear him speak, and we find the speech of one who is no victim, no child of circumstances, but the Son of God, the Logos incarnate, and all the majesty of the eternities and the authority of God merge in his attitudes and in his speech. So if you want to know what God thinks, you look at Jesus. If you want to know what God says, you, look, you listen to Jesus. Um, really very unique, very sui generis, as we say, one of a kind. I'll close with this quote from Lewis. If ever a myth had become fact, and by the way, he wrote this. This comes from a time when he was sort of turning toward faith. That makes this quote so much more remarkable to me. If ever a myth had become fact, had been incarnated, it would be just like this. Here and here only in all time, the myth must have become fact. The word flesh, God, man, this is not a religion nor a philosophy. It is the summing up and actuality of them all. <laughs> and that's just mind-blowing. You listen to his mind going, and you continue to see how the Lord was working on him, wooing him, drawing to the place where he would see Jesus as the Word made flesh, God incarnate. God become one of us to come with salvation in his hand to put on offer to you and to put on offer to me. Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you for the way you've revealed yourself that it isn't up to us to discover you, nor could we. Our prejudice would get in the way. Our preferences would get in the way. Our delusions would get in the way. Thank you for revealing yourself to us with the word made flesh so that in very tangible ways we just look to Jesus, put our hope, our faith, our confidence, and trust in him. He's at the center as we consider the incarnation during this season. Thank you for the holidays. Thank you for family. Thank you for all the fun, all the lights, all the candles, all this stuff. Uh, thank you for all of that, Lord, the songs especially. But mostly, thank you for coming and being coming one of us. So that as you came, not only to show us what it means to be human, but to give us new life, to be the bread that we need, to be our good shepherd, as John's gospel reveals, to be the door for us, to be the resurrection and the life for us. Lord, no matter where we're at, uh, no matter where we're at in our spiritual journey right now, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would move in our hearts and our minds and help us to see Jesus and to trust in him, in whose name we pray, amen and amen.